Edward Hopper. A large man as taciturn as the figures in many of his paintings, used to grumble that those who talked about his paintings overdid the loneliness thing. Nonetheless, his best pictures seem to depict the experience of isolation. Hopper's people are lost within themselves, even when they are in the presence of others. Hopper did not like being called an American scene painter either, and there it is easier to go along with him. His famous pictures of a man standing by a row of petrol pumps outside a rural filling station, or of a shop facades on 7th Avenue, Manhattan, on a Sunday morning, are as concerned with a certain structure of feeling as with topography. But that structure of feeling is the loneliness thing. You feel it in Hopper's masterpieces like Nighthawks, with its four jaded figures in the illuminated interior of an all-night cafe, and in many of the pictures of office workers, travelers, hotel guests, and theater people. You can hardly avoid it either in the compelling studies of anonymous women glimpsed dressing or undressing in the cold but intimate spaces of brilliantly lit bedrooms. It even pervades the pictures of isolated buildings by railroads, or the later images of empty rooms in which no men and women appear at all. These two seem somehow dominated by the absence of the figure. It would in fact be hard to say anything convincing about Hopper without stressing the loneliness thing. His paintings are so conspicuously about vacuity, sadness, futility, emptiness, and yes, experience of isolation on the fringes of the American dream. But how does this relate to the qualities of his work and to his stature as an artist? According to many contemporary American critics, Hopper has been crippled by these preoccupations. For example, a standard text on American art declares that pictorially, Hopper was as limited, average, and undistinguished as the humiliated landscape, the dilapidated and gloomy picturesque architecture, and the drab urban scenes that he made in the stock and trade of his subject matter. Hopper is an embarrassment to American partisans of modernism and avant-gardism. Their art history books and the layout of their modern art museums are designed to prove that all that is of value in recent modern art has been created by handing down the torch of stylistic innovation first ignited by Cezanne. They assume this was born aloft in a triumphant historicist progression through the early European modernist movements and on into the achievements of American abstract expressionism and its successes. But it was just this development that Hopper refused. He objected to the papery qualities of Cezanne and was not significantly affected by anything that happened later. And yet Hopper clearly could not be dismissed as some hillbilly, regionless or dumb primitive. When Henry Galzala organized his massive 1970 exhibition of American art since 1940 at the Metropolitan Museum, Hopper was the only outsider at the modernist garden party. But he was hardly a welcome guest. Not one of the copious critical essays in the catalogue so much as mentioned his name. More recently, however, even in the art institutions have begun to acknowledge that modernism is in crisis. What once looked like Hopper's weaknesses are now acclaimed as his strengths. He is praised as the painter of modern life par excellence. Alternatively, he is interpreted as a great neutralist realist who refused style altogether and simply transcribed exactly the appearance of contemporary reality. But these estimates of Hopper won't stand up either. There are many bad paintings about modern life. Hopper himself painted some of them. He is, in fact, a very uneven artist. Not more than 15 of his pictures are wholly convincing, and there are works in this exhibition so second-rate that it is hard to believe they were made by the man who produced, say, Nighthawks. But those hoppers which approach the condition of masterpieces are certainly not the ones in which he most faithfully transcribes appearances. The working drawings included in this exhibition demonstrate how carefully his best paintings were constituted. All sorts of disparate, observed elements are used to construct a single picture. The artist's role is anything but neutral. 
case of Edward Hopper appears more complex than either the modernists or their opponents allow. Hopper was taught by Robert Henry, a turn-of-the-century American artist with a deep admiration for Velázquez, Howes, Goya, Dormier, and the pre-impressionist pictures of Manet and Degas. Henry wanted an art saturated in modern life, but he tried to realize this through physiognomy, the expressions of his subjects. He was a versatile portraitist of men and women in every condition. Henry opposed aestheticism and revived the concerns of early 19th century American painters, like the great Thomas Aikens, who had tried to root their art in the scientific study of the body. Hopper thought Aikens greater than Manet. Under Henry, Hopper learned to draw the figure. The transformations of its expressions and poses were the first expressive language he mastered. But in 1906, Hopper went to Paris and encountered Impressionism. All he had learned led him to resist the dissolution of concrete forms into hazes of light. Nonetheless, in his paintings, he began to rely not just on the body and the world as objects of perception, but also upon elements drawn from the processes of perception themselves. In particular, transformations of luminosity and of depicted space join those of the figure as part of the material upon which he drew to make his pictures. After 1910, Hopper never crossed the Atlantic again, but it took him a long time to integrate what he had learned during this American apprenticeship with the discoveries of his visits to Paris. For a time, he stopped painting and found work as an illustrator but he complained that he never felt satisfied drawing people's grimacing and posturing. He longed to paint sunlight on the side of a house. Of course, he did not just wish to record it. Hopper was contemptuous of painting which tried to short-circuit imagination. Great art, he once wrote, is the outward expression of an inner life in the artist, and this inner life will result in his personal vision of the world. In 1920s, when he was in his 40s, Hopper finally found a way of working in which the expressive potentialities of the figure, perceived space and light, were combined together under the directing force of the imagination to create convincing pictures. Through these painterly means he could, when he wished, say something about those structures of feeling characteristic of modern life. Take Automa of 1926. A woman is seated at a circular table near the door of the automa. The chair in front of her is empty. Beneath the dome of her hand, her eyes are downcast. She has just taken a sip of coffee. Perhaps she is thinking about something that is not there. Behind her on the sill is a bowl of fruit. The round lights of the interior, reflected in the window, run out into the night and are swallowed up by it. She is framed by a great pain of emptiness and silence. She is alone. Why is this such an effective picture? In part, it is because of the handling of the figure itself. She is comprised of very simple forms, yet everything about her, eyes, lips, hands and legs, is expressive of those emotions Hopper wishes to communicate. But the play of light and colors, particularly the contrast between the uncomfortable luminosity of the cafe and the undispersible darkness of the night outside, serve the same purpose. These elements, however, acquire their expressive strength within the compositional structure of the picture. This is not, of course, a transcription of a given scene or anything like it. The forceful geometry of the painting has been built up through Hopper's self-conscious choices and simplifications. For example, in the way he plays off the circular form of the woman's hat, coffee cup, table, fruit bowl, and light against the rectangle shapes of the corner of the room. Above all, Hopper has carefully framed that woman against that potentially engulfing plane of blackness. This is intended to tell us more about her emotional state than about his empirical observations. The content of this painting is thus certainly the loneliness thing. But it is not this on its own which makes it effective. James Joyce once said, sentimentality is unearned emotion. It is easy to imagine a sentimental picture on the theme Hopper depicts here, 
but the emotion in Automat has been earned by the way in which the artist brings it to cohere in all aspects of his expressive practice, including those to do with the figure, light and structure, and further unifies all these elements into a convincing compositional whole. And this is why I think both modernists, with their insistence that only new styles can be of value in painting, and their opponents, with their vague appeals to modern life, or the need faithfully to record appearances, are both missing the point about Hopper's best work. Indeed, Hopper reminds me strongly of Mark Rothko, who was perhaps the best of America's abstract expressionist painters. Stylistically, of course, they have nothing in common, Yet the area of experience which Rothko expressed through his chosen pictorial conventions was peculiarly close to Hopper's. Rothko at first a figure painter turned to wholly abstract works of glowing colour fields through which he chronicled his struggle against depression, alienation and despair. Eventually a billowing black cloud of negative space began to appear ever more frequently in his work. Visually, it looked not unlike the purplish subsuming plane in Automat. Finally, it engulfed not just his pictures, but Rothko himself. Hopper's work seems to follow a similar, though less dramatic, extreme development. As he grew older, Hopper seemed to become less and less comfortable with the presence of figures in his paintings. Sometimes his later works seem cluttered as if he's throwing in as many forms as he could to cover that nothingness glimpsed in Automat. In other works, the figures are so badly drawn and proportioned that one feels Hopper would have been happier leaving them out altogether. Indeed, the most successful of his later interiors are those of the walls of empty rooms. In these, the proximities to Rothko's concerns are self-evident. It is as if Hopper no longer wished the figures of others in the world to impinge upon that expressive space which he was trying to construct in his pictures. To some, this comparison between Hopper and Rothko may sound forced or fanciful, but Hopper himself once said, To me, form, color, and design are merely means to an end. The tools I work with, and they do not interest me greatly for their own sake, I am interested in primarily in the vast field of experience and sensation. Similarly, Roscoe, protesting against those who called his work abstracts, wrote, It is not my painting's intention either to create or emphasize a formal color space arrangement. They depart from my natural representation only to intensify the expression of the subject implied in the title not to dilute or efface it. The painterly means Hopper and Rothko used may have been very different, but the areas of experience and sensation which they each so effectively expressed were, in fact, very similar. <laughs>